Uh, thank you. That's a great presentation to follow. I want to talk about standards, um, and I spend a lot of time in my career developing standards. Uh, for this audience, um, I've been involved in ANSI C6319 for, well, since its beginning in 1996 on uh, compatibility between mobile phones and hearing aids. Uh, so a lot of this is lessons learned out of that activity. Um, I have uh, five major areas I want to touch on. Uh, as I've worked in standards, and like most people, I kind of wandered into it, I've come to realize that standards are a tool, and actually it's a variety of tools that serve different purposes. They can be multi-party contracts. They can be vehicles for knowledge transfer. They can be um, specifications to ensure interoperability. Uh, and then we'll discover there's different kinds of interoperability. They're a vehicle for uh, facilitating conformity management and conformity assessment systems, which all of our regulatory processes are intended to do. Uh, those things that make sure that products and services meet specifications in reality in deployment with real users in the field. And they can be a tool for technology planning. Uh, letting one industry segment signal to another one where they're going and how they can stay linked up. Um, all right. So uh, standards is multi-party contracts. And, and the primary point I'm making is if standards are a tool and actually there is a collection of tools, we do well to understand which tool we need, what's the job we're trying to do, and what's the system into which we're trying to provide a, a solution. So with C6319, we were trying to get the hearing industry and the mobile phone industry together to solve a problem of interference and also make sure that T-coil and microphone mode work between the phones. Work started in 96. We're now in the fourth revision. Uh, the standard is mandated by the FCC and recognized by the FDA. So I think, um, in general, we've been successful. Obviously, we didn't get it perfect out of the box. We were on standard version 4 and actively talking about what we might need to do in version 5. But also, in both industries, technology has changed. So there's been some of that. Um, Consensus is almost impossible when cost and consequences are not aligned. That's one of the lessons we've learned, um, and it's worth thinking about, because it's not unusual that if one industry would just pay a little bit more, someone else would get a benefit. Well, how are you going to make that happen? Not easy. A uh, solution for C6319 was the application of COSIS theorem. Um, and it was done in a very creative way behind the scenes. Not a lot of people realize it. But um, at the beginning of that process, I think it would be fair to say that the phone industry and the hearing industry, which are very different culturally, they're very different in size, a lot of things, um, were both kind of finger pointing, it's your fault. Uh, from the hearing industry, we were here first. You came along and caused a problem, so you ought to solve it. From the phone side, we can't function without transmitting RF. You need to move into the modern world. Um, a, what I think is a brilliant move, uh, one of the phone companies sent some RF engineers not to a hearing aid company, but to a hearing aid chip manufacturer and showed them how to make an RF immune chip. Now they had something that would differentiate their chip from other chips on the market. And all a hearing aid manufacturer had to do is go buy the RF immune chip. And their sensitivity to RF interference improved by a factor of 100 or more. Well, now they could differentiate their products from their competitors. And all of a sudden, market forces started kicking in. And all of a sudden, we could, got a consensus and finished the standard. Uh, there was a lot of knowledge transfer. And I've seen this in other standards. We had to have psychoacoustic experts explain to phone designers um, what was going on, the kinds of presentations we've heard here in this conference. This was new information. And so in the early days of those meetings, a lot of letting one area, body of experts present to the other 
and understand each other's landscape enough to find consensus solutions. RF expertise, as I explained, was moved to uh, hearing aid chip vendors and component manufacturers. And specialized testing expertise was communicated to commercial test labs so that companies could take their products and get them tested. So looking today, what, what do we need in the future? Um, it really hit my ear, and this is parallel to some other things I'm seeing, the comments that the audiogram is not enough. It's not enough to just raise volume. There's sig issues of signal quality, and those tend to change with the technology that we're using. Um, and I'm seeing signs of that as we're going to more digital technologies. There's new artifacts that find their way into the acoustic stream that are problematic, and our old tests don't necessarily catch them. So in RF, we have something called the error vector magnitude that is coming into use that's dealing with some complexity in RF digital signals. I would argue that uh, we seem to be needing something equivalent for audio quality and demodulated RF. Um, one of the innovative things that we did in the fourth version of the standard, where before we regulated RF based on raw amplitude, in the newest version, we regulate the phones based on the amount of interference they create in the hearing aid. So they can have as much RF as they want from the standard viewpoint, as long as it doesn't cause interference. And it turns out you can vary the amount of interference by a factor of 100 to 1,000 based on your waveform and how it demodulates into the audio band. So that was something we did, and I'm very pleased, and I think it's a thought that can go into the future. We also need standards on acoustic and biologic stay-away zones. There's only certain kinds of modulations that demodulate down and can be a biologic signature, either audio interference or misunderstood as, um, let's say, a heartbeat or lack of a heartbeat. RF designers, waveform uh, architects, don't know the consequences of their decisions in waveforms as to what might then result in an interference problem that would cause problems with medical devices or hearing aids. They need to know that uh, because they can move those bit streams if you catch them at the right place when they're doing their technology planning. Interoperability. Um, critical purpose that standards can play, and we do that. We're working um, on many of these in the area of coexistence, which is just basically if your equipment and my equipment are close together, we don't mess each other up. But then we may want to go to a next level of where our equipment isn't the same, but we mean the same things and our measures mean the same. If I say mine's a four and you say yours is a five, those numbers mean the same thing. There are standards like that. And then we go to a deeper level where units from different manufacturers work with each other for core functions or for all functions. That gets really complex. And you start to, while you bring people together, you also start to do interesting things about stifling innovation because obviously you want, in this case, everyone to be the same. You want everyone to be able to plug into the power plug anywhere from any manufacturer's plug and wall outlet. Um, interoperability seldom works out without an effective feedback system. And one of the things I've learned is you really have to understand the system. If you do a wonderful standard, but the labs don't test properly, you're not going to get the outcome you want. If you don't have a way to get feedback out of actual market uh, experience and then adjust uh, put out interpretations where people are misunderstanding the standard, um, you're not going to get the outcome you desire. So that leads us into conformity management. Very arcane area, but every regulator works in this field. We have international standards on it. Um, standards are not an end in themselves. They are simply a tool that goes into a larger process, such as testing in laboratories, that then go into quality management systems, 
hopefully to make sure that products and services meet requirements in reality. Um, other mechanisms are necessary to ensure that technical requirements lead to the right outcomes. One of the things I do uh, almost as a hobby is a lab assessment for accreditation. And it's real interesting when you have a new version of the standard and um, you go in and you ask a lab manager, how do you tell the difference between a good outcome and a bad outcome? And they can't tell you the answer. Um, then how do you know that you can screen out the bad ones? That's part of those who wrote the standard knew, knew exactly what they had in mind, but it's that translation function of making sure that lab assessors can make sure that labs understand so that excellent products get through, good products get through, but those that are below par get returned for further work. Standards can also facilitate market forces. When consumers don't know how to identify an excellent product from a poorly designed product, they can't make informed choice. And I'm going to go into some recent data that I'm still scratching my head about. For a series of reasons, um, I got looking at how many Wi-Fi devices, and in this case Wi-Fi equipped laptops, support dual bands. We Wi-Fi uh, can operate in the 2.4 gigahertz band and the 5 gigahertz band. And as you can see, in about 2009, uh, dual band laptops actually dropped down to about 20%. So 80% can only operate in one band. Now, as you'll see in a minute, uh, so this is the picture of if you actually go and make measurements. And actually, I made some measurements in the back. And this is true in this room right now. Those of you who are checking your email or whatever, 80% of you are crowded into three channels in the 2.4 band, even though there are 21 channels available to you in the 5 gigahertz band. That's true right now in this room uh, by measurements I made yesterday. So what sense does this make? I mean, this is like we're all creating a traffic congestion driving downtown every morning. Why do we do that? Here's the FCC uh, frequency allocations. And you can see there's three non-overlapping channels with the latest version of the Wi-Fi 4 in the 2.4 gigahertz band. But that's 80% of our traffic. 80% of our devices can only operate there. And then all this other spectrum landscape is available. Well, let me ask you, how many of you know that you were operating on either the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz band? <laughs> OK. I got one hand. And I could raise my hand, I suppose. <laughs> so what's really, what's really interesting, and I, I've been making, a, well, I actually have a reason to do it for some research we're working on. I've yet to find any device operating in the channels, that middle section and four of these in this lower band that require dynamic frequency selection, transmit power control. So the FCC's allowed all these channels, and no one's using them. Why is that? And then how many people even know that they could be using them, but they're not? That's so. And so here's some uh, uh, data I recently took at, at uh, different places, uh, some gates uh, that I was actually, this was last week. And the data in this room is pretty similar. But you can see. We've got about 25 channels available. And for reasons of herd mentality, 40 to 60% of the traffic's all crowded into one channel. And guess what happens to the amount of interference and problems? Well, it turns out the same thing happens with RF choices. And what we really have to worry about then in terms of what we're doing is you give any product developer a choice. And the only logical uh, option for price, for simplicity of design, for a lot of reasons, is to go to Bluetooth, to Wi-Fi. But that billion devices that we heard about a few minutes ago is not optimized for this community. And if our reliability levels, if our service levels are different, 
you're going to have a mismatch and potentially unintended consequences. So it's really important to understand what are the dynamics, what's the, I've come to love a word ontology, what are the relational links between seemingly separate areas that, that guide us to act in certain ways and create group dynamics that perhaps we put us places we don't want to be. So over and over again, what we see is when a company that's not a hardcore RF company does RF, they get what they think is an RF network expert, they grabs a module, puts it in the product, and voila, it's a wireless product and you're in there with all the other devices, chances are you're single band down in the most crowded place where the most things operate and you've done it for very good business reasons, but is that really the service level and the reliability level that we want to be at? So technology planning. Um, once you start looking at those things, um, you, you, you come to different sorts of, you know, how do we keep people in synchronization? Um, the whole cell phone industry is moving to fourth generation. Um, and I can tell you we've had the, the availability of our standard has been one of the few meeting points where the industries talk about, well, what does that mean? What does it change? And what do we need to be sensitive to on the hearing aid side so that we stay synced up? Different. Technologies require different metrics, and this has been interesting. If you look at the history of audio standards, there's a new audio standard virtually every time we move to a different technology. And this is certainly true in telephony. You can see this whole march of there's some audio standards, audio quality standards for wireline, and then when we went to cordless, there was a different set, and with voice over IP, we have another set. We keep having to change the metrics because the mechanisms tend to change, the failure issues tend to change, and then we find out things are getting through our tests that shouldn't be getting through our tests. We can all hear it's a problem, but it's passing the test. So then we have to get in and figure out, well, what's wrong, and get a new test for the new technology. You can see that progression. It's one of the reasons standards need to be looking forward and keeping us current on those things. We'd rather know about that before we get a lot of product out in the field than after. And among the most difficult challenges is how to end of life one technology and move to a better solution. And that's really tough. I have no idea how to do it. But we can't just keep and, and, and. It's not sustainable in the long run. So how do we overlap? How do we give incentive for people to move to a new and potentially much better solution while not leaving people isolated and orphaned with what had been the previous solution. I think it's something we need to map out, else our regulations end up becoming anti-innovative, and that's not where we want to be. So ontology, uh, understanding the relational links between seemingly un unrelated areas. Uh, there's some real interesting work in this area. Um, the task is to map and then manage the complex ontologies that work with hearing loss. I would argue that most of what we've been talking about is trying to understand what's this ontology that we're all working in. What are the dynamics? What are the relational links? How do we manage it to get to a better future? Um, it's vital both to the intended and unintended consequences, hence my question earlier this morning. Uh, and then I would highlight that we need to understand types of innovation. And a uh, previous speaker brought up disruptive innovations. Sustaining innovations are fairly easy. But when someone comes up, as the previous speaker did, with something that's really a different way of approaching things, um, that tends to be disruptive. Standards and regulations tend to block disruptive innovations. And I don't think socially we want to do that. But it takes a lot of careful thinking to make sure that we don't. Um, so conclusion, standards can serve a variety of purposes. It's important to understand the role, know your tool, and why you're choosing the one you're 
you're choosing. Standards are not a panacea. And they don't solve all problems. Standards are great when they're the right tool for the job. And they're lousy when they're a mismatch or it's like just a feel-good exercise. When standards are part of a conformity management system, the other parts of the system have to be in place or you're not going to get what you want. Standards and regulations tend to suppress innovation, particularly disruptive innovation. It's just a fact of life. And I think it's a challenge to regulators and standards developers to try and minimize that and be intelligent about what we do. Um, one of the uh, outcomes, I think, is to really focus on the outcomes and be very slow to dictate methods. Sometimes we do have to dictate, dictate methods, but we want to be very slow to do that. Um, and we should be alert when there may be um, different outcomes for different groups. And I think a comment that really hit my ears yesterday was, would this conference come to different conclusions if we had one conference for mild hearing loss and another for moderate to profound hearing loss? Um, you know, standards can document a multi-party consensus, and when they do that well, they, they can really be powerful. Um, and a challenge can be to move from one consensus that's right for the past to one that's right for the future. Um, so that's what I thank you for your time. Thank you. So in continuing our theme about new approaches and new ideas, our next speaker is Valerie Fletcher from the Institute for Human-Centered Design. <laughs> 